your glory and to the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our precious God and Savior, our kinsman Redeemer, our bright morning star. We pray for this remembrance of the precious life of Stephen Mitchell. I pray for the speakers and for words and life for them. This is all to your glory, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Romans 14, 8 says, If we die, we live. If we live for the Lord. And if we die, we live. We die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Amen. On behalf of the Mitchell families, my wife and I, Mark, Jen, Sapria, and our grandkids, we want to just welcome you to this celebration service. We'd like to say how grateful we are to the so many, so many words of encouragement, words of love and prayers over the, over the Internet, Facebook. They, they've come from all over the world. We just are overwhelmed. But it's been such a help to us in our time of grief. I'm sure you may already be wondering, not you, but those who are watching, what's this Aloha shirt thing all about? Well, we lived in Hawaii for 25 years, and when we left Hawaii, Steve brought Hawaii with him. <laughs> and we teased him from time to time, because most of us, when the fall comes or the winter, we put up our shirts, but not Steve. It may be six inches or ten inches of snow, and he'll come in an Aloha shirt. And not all the time, but so we ask anybody who wanted to, to wear Aloha attire, uh, anything. So you'll hear the word Aloha maybe a number of times. I'd like to just express the appreciation, too, also to the two pastorates that Steve had. Steve loved being a pastor. 
And one of the number of reasons was because God called him to pastor two wonderful churches. My wife and I want to express our appreciation to these churches because it, it, over, it just so much brings us so much joy as parents to hear Steve talk about how much he, he loved the people in these churches and how they loved him back. His first church, when he, it, it, in the Garden City Grace Brethren Church in Roanoke, Virginia, and then now this church, who we love as well, the Fellowship Bible Chapel. Boy, you folks have just made my son's life so, and Sapria, they just, it was so great when Steve would come, and he'd always have something wonderful to say about you folks. And you loved him back. And that meant the world to us, I believe me. We learned something from this, that we knew Steve touched a lot of lives, but nowhere near what we are finding out. I've learned some things I never knew about the extent of his ministry. God gave Steve a wonderful asset, and that was he had the ability to genuinely love people. And he gave that ability, by the way, to our other son, Mark, that's here as well. We've been really blessed with two wonderful sons. Personalities are different, but if you know Steve, you know Mark. And if you know Mark, you know Steve. Steve never hesitated for a second to end the conversation with, I love you, man. You might be a woman. <laughs> that was it. But the thing is, he sincerely meant that from his heart. It wasn't just a catchphrase. And every time I'd hear him in the phone call, I'd hear him say, I love you, man. I love you. And he, he so did. Now, I'd like to take you back for my part. And with a long, long, long three-hour story cut down <laughs> to about, I hope, 20 minutes. There was so much we could say, and everything we say, I could add, add, and add, but I can't do that, and it's a little frustrating. But I'd like to share with you Steve's ministry. And at one point, how his ministry, along with some of his wonderful buddy friends, changed my way of thinking in a way that made me a better pastor and a better man. And people have always asked, who influenced you most in the ministry? And I have to say, my son. Because of something they did for the Lord, when a lot of people were in objection to it, but they knew this is what God's called us to do. Living in Hawaii, Steve was very instrumental in reaching teenagers. The teens really loved him because he knew they, they knew that he loved them. Many of them were from the surfing community on the North Shore in Hawaii. He was maybe 18 or 19, I'm not sure, attending the University, University of Hawaii, and he was a youth pastor at the North Shore Christian Fellowship, another wonderful church. It reached out to young people in a special way. Steve and some good buddies one day rented a cottage near the famous Pipeline Surfing Championships, and Steve would pack that, the, his living room full of young people, young surfers and some old surfers, too. If you've ever seen an old surfer, that's an experience, too. <laughs> but he would pack those rooms, and he would teach Bible studies. And the impact he had was quite great because one day they were having a world champion uh, surfing contest and one of the champion, world champions in Australia came, came to it. And when he found out Steve wasn't teaching, he was so upset. He said, I really didn't care anything about joining this, this surfing contest. I came from Australia to hear Steve. And of course, he didn't get to because this was a time later when Steve had moved on in different areas in his ministry. But one day Steve came to me, and I could tell there was something on his heart. And he said, Dad, I got something to tell you. I said, uh oh. <laughs> I said, What, son? He said, and he named them Frank and Tom and Roper and, and, and Pat and and Sean and these guys, they were, and they were wonderful Christian young men too. And he said, Dad, 
we're going to start a Christian band. Oh, that's great, son. What's that? What? Wait, Dad. <laughs> it's going to be a heavy metal Christian band. Oh. What's a heavy metal Christian band? <laughs> we're very careful. I'm, I'm sitting here kind of in shock, but yet I knew these guys' hearts, and it didn't mix. I said, hey, man, I'm a child of the 50s. I'm a doo-wop fan. <laughs> and I still am. But anyway, he looked at me and said, Dad, he said, we have to do this. He said, the, the teenagers out here, the kids, there's nobody here out for them except a church or two. But he said, they're lost and they're hurting and we think we can reach them. I said, well, son, if you think you can do that, I got something else to tell you, Dad. <laughs> what? The name of a band? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the name of the band is Bloodbath. <laughs> Bloodbath. And if you see their insignia, Steve was an artist too, but if you see their shirt, it was a skull with three crosses coming out of it. It would scare the living daylights out of people. <laughs> but that cross, that shirt had a message. And anybody that would say, what, oh, what does that mean? You could give the whole plan of salvation through that drawing. They wrote their own songs. So that was one plus. And if you'd read their song, the lyrics to their music, you'd see, you'd see music that Words that gave the plan of salvation. You'd see words about the love of God. You'd see words about heaven, and you'd see words about hell. It was the full spectrum. Well, I couldn't understand the words, and I did ask Steve. I said, Steve, you don't even play an instrument. What are you going to do? I'm the singer. <laughs> Later on, we called him Singer Screamer. But you know, the kids could hear and they could understand these things. But I'm still kind of you know, hard-nosed about it, but not saying much. By the way, they later, later changed their name from Bloodbath to Theocracy AD, and my son's wearing one of the T-shirts. And we were happy for that one. <laughs> things went along real good. By the way, this band lasted 10 years. They became very well-known in Hawaii. One day he comes to me a couple years later after I've adjusted. By the way, with the band comes the hair. And after a while, I used to tell Steve, if a bird ever flew in there, buddy, that's not coming out. <laughs> and we'd laugh because, I mean, this was a little later when I really realized they had a ministry. But then one day he comes up to me and said, Dad, I got something to tell you. Oh, boy, here we go. I remember that. What? He said, we're going to play some of the bars down in Waikiki and Honolulu. Uh, you'll do what? We're going to play some of the bars. Okay, son, uh, tell me more. <laughs> he said, Dad, they've given us permission to share the gospel before we play. Can you imagine that in a bar? One guy that I remember that made the statement, he said, I was a backslidden Christian I was in a bar, and I never expected to hear about Jesus, and here they come. And he said, that, that was God speaking to me to come back. So that was those years. It was during that time that Steve began to take mission trips. He went to Australia, first of all. But then he went on mission trips to India. And I was even able to go and spend two weeks with him in India. That was an experience. I love the Indian people. I went to Communist China also, and I love them too, but they don't speak to you. They don't know. They're suspicious, but the Indian people, they, they have a custom. The men do, and it was a little hard to get used to. You see two men walking down the street holding hands. And I come out of a church service one day, and one of the guys come up to me and took my hand. We went walking down the street. <laughs> I had to figure something that... I got a scratch. <laughs> so, but again, I, <laughs> they were wonderful people. 
One day Steve came to me and he said, Dad, I know someday you'd like to have, you and Mom would like to have grandchildren, and, but Dad, I don't think I'll ever get married. So what do you mean, son? He said, I don't think an American woman would come down and live like this. He lived in an apartment in the slums of Mumbai. There was a big sewage ditch beside his apartment that ran for all the time with sewage. The slum there is different. By the way, the people in those slums, some of them are, are wonderful. But it's a way of life that, no, none of us would ever adjust to hardly. But you know what? One day a beautiful young lady brought her youth group down from Pune. She was in a different part of India, a uh, really a nice area, but she brought them down. And she and Steve met. And long story short, he brought home a, a daughter to us, a beautiful young lady. And she's here, and she's going to share too. But back to his mission trips. I'm drying out. I need some water. Uh, back, on one trip to India, you want to take the cap off here? Okay. <laughs> on one of the trips to India, while he was there, he went to another country, a country on the border that were persecuting Christians, killing Christians. We didn't know this till afterwards, which I'm so glad we didn't find out until afterwards. But he went, he was smuggled, he was an Ill illegal alien for about a week. He smuggled him into that country because it was a church that was suffering and they needed somebody to come and encourage them and to have somebody come from a country, another country. And so he preached there for a while. They had to smuggle to get him out of the country. So they put, he got in the back of a pickup truck. They put a tarp over that, over, tied it down. They got to the border. Didn't ask him, they didn't ask anything about it, but the, the guard took a foot-long bayonet and began to stab into that tarp. He stabbed about three or four times. Figuring if there's anyone in there, they got him. But you know what? Not one of those stabs hit Steve. And he came out. Then a little bit later, he was known now in the slums there as the Bible man, the American Bible man who lived in the slums. And that was unusual because they had good, good missionaries in India, but many of them lived up in the better part of them, and they'd come down. Steve lived down. And he became known. And some Hindu extremists didn't like that. And they put in the paper that he had converted 300 Hindus to Christ. Steve said, oh, I only wish that were true. <laughs> but they sought to kill him. And so one night, I think I've got this pretty, pretty much right, but they came to his apartment, his church did, They'd come in bicycles, and they said, Steve, you got to get out of here. you got to leave the country tonight. They're looking for you, and they're going to kill you. So they took him to the airport, and he gets on the plane. We don't know anything about this now. I'm sitting in the living room in Hawaii watching TV, and he walks in. I don't believe in ghosts as such, but I thought for a minute, whoa, what is this? You know. We were so glad to see him, and he shared with us. We were so thankful that he was alive, and we said, oh, we're glad you're here, he said. But, Dad, <laughs> here he goes again. What? I'm going back. That's the only time I ever said to him, you can't do that. Don't. You can't. They're, gonna, they're waiting for you. I can't help it, Dad. He said, i got to go back. There's people there I'm ministering to. By the way, this is before he, he met Supriya. He said, there are people I'm ministering to, and I've got to go back to them. And I'll tell you, boy, a couple of weeks later, we took him to the airport. It was really hard because my wife and I, we knew that we are never going to see him again. If he comes back, it would be in a body bag. And to let him go like that, it was, and somebody, some people said, you shouldn't have let him go. Well, you don't tell a 22, 23, oh, you can't do it. Well, we could have ranted and raved, and but it we knew that God was speaking to him about this, and even though we knew he may never come back, we sent him off with God's blessings. 
Well, things was eased up when we got back when he got back, and so he carried on with his ministry there, and that's again where he met uh, Supriya, and, and uh, so again that was that story. That was two days, and I just put it into you in about fifteen minutes, I think. There's so much to say. But moving ahead, coming back home now with his bride, he took the pastorate of his first church, the Garden City Grace Brethren Church. He wanted to stay there the rest of his life. He said, I love these people, and I want to minister to them. And they, they would like him to have done that too. And, uh, but he had other plans. After nine years, God had other plans for him. And so he was confused too. He said, God, why would you take me away from the church that's doing so well? I've discovered I had two pastors, very much like his, so I knew exactly what he was feeling. But I tell you, when a pastor leaves a church that's in good shape, that's the best way to leave. Because you always have the memories, and they will never forget you either. And I, I, you know, I, I could see him agonizing over this. Lightning doesn't strike twice, he thought. And so when he left there, he came to here, the Fellowship Bible Chapel. And it wasn't long, a couple months into the ministry here, he told me with such a smile, he said, Dad, lightning struck twice. He said, I'm pastoring a church full of people that are so loving, and I love them. And you know, that's what almost chokes me up, because I knew what he was feeling, because I left a church in Tennessee to come to a church in Hawaii with the same, same feeling and same thing. So he had planned to stay with you folks as long as you would want him to stay. And I can say one thing, when he got sick and later when he passed on, I'm sure there are times when he felt such warmth or whatever because he knew, he knew you were praying for him. He knew people were praying. We never knew how many. We we just we'd sit back and go, whoa, there are people from other countries, or I don't know, five or six other countries. Uh, he went to Africa for a little while to preach, and people from there, thousand praying for him. And that's given us great joy too. So again, I want to thank all of you that made his life extra special because it made our lives extra special, too. Before I turn it over to somebody else, a lot of the emails are saying, how could you, how can you deal with this? How can you handle this? Because I made the statement, along with great grief, there's great joy. We did a lot of crying. We'd cry one minute and something happened. We'd start to talk and laugh. and It was such a peace sometimes. And, of course, the devil's always, he's having a ball. With, he loves this. And we didn't let him win it. And some people said, how can you even think of laughing or smiling when you're such grief? And there might be some of you that are watching, not here in this room, but you're watching all over the country, wherever. And you might be wondering, how, how, how could you do that? He must have a super spiritual family. No, that's not it at all. But all of us have a relationship with Jesus Christ. One day, thousands of years ago, Jesus was born of a virgin. He was a human being, but he was a perfect human being. He was Emmanuel, God with us. And he offered a way for us to have eternal life with him by going on the cross. It had to be somebody perfect. He went upon the cross, and he paid for the sins of mankind. But there was a requirement, and that is they have to accept him. A person has to say, Jesus, I believe you are God. I believe who you are. I believe that you died for my sins, and I want you to be my Savior. And the Holy Spirit comes in and saves you. Now, my whole family has experienced that. And I, I, I'll make the statement, if there's any of you out there that are still wondering, how can you have grief and joy at the same time? 
If you do not know my Lord, you can only have one. It can only be grief. You don't won't have any idea of the joy side. But if you have Christ, you have both grief, and I'm telling you, it can be grieving, but you have joy. And I've even surprised myself at how, how much I've laughed and enjoyed times. And there's a time to cry and there's a time to laugh. And I just want to invite anybody that may, that's listening on, if you just, just do not know what I'm saying, if you still are saying, I don't, I don't understand, I urge you to find a good Bible-believing Christian and let them share with you that plan of salvation. And you can even contact me if you want. And I'd love to share with you how you can have grief and joy at the same time. Most of you in this room, I hope all of you, you, are, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm really not talking to you unless, again, unless you're one that doesn't understand. Another thing about knowing the Lord is it's not an end. Steve and I are going to see each other. He's going to see you. We're going to be together. It's hard. It's going to be hard. Pray for his dear wife and my wonderful granddaughter. This is not easy. It will not be easy. But the same God that has given us the grief and the joy will give them what they need with the help of others. others. They're going to pull through okay. And again, I want to thank all of you. Those of you in this room, those of you out there, thank you for loving my son. He loved you too. So I'm going to end with what he might say. Aloha. I love you guys. Thanks, Dave. Now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, play several videos from people who knew and ministered with uh, Steve over the years. First, Nate, uh, Frank Figueroa from Hawaii, then Nathan Lee, and then Jacob Prash. So here we go. Aloha. I'm Frank, and I'm honored and yet deeply saddened to be sharing with you today my memories of Stephen Thomas Mitchell. Before I get started, I would like to say to Supriya, Malia, Pastor Dave, and Betty Lou, Mark, Jen, Jordan, Casey, and the Brethren at Fellowship Bible Chapel. I am so, so sorry. In fact, my heart grieves for you deeply. My wife's and my prayers are with you. Let me first tell you how I met Steve. I actually knew his brother Mark first, and one day I was picking up Mark since he was gonna help me run sound for a Daryl Mansfield concert. And there as I pulled up along the curb in front of their house in Waipahu was Steve talking on one of those big first-generation wireless phones, you know, the kind with the two-foot collapsible antenna, standing there in his underwear in the front yard. And it wasn't no boxers either. Tidy whities BVDs wrapped around his skinny body. And he just looked at me and said, what's up? That left a first impression that I will never forget. Once we became friends, we were always together, spending hours with the band either writing music or playing shows. We seen a million faces and we rocked them all. Well, maybe just a thousand faces. We taught Bible studies together for many years. And there are only a couple of people that I have found in this world that have the same. heart and same doctrine on the essentials when it comes to God's word as I have. Steve is one of those people. This allowed us to develop an amazing friendship, wait, more like brotherhood, that transcended what we all thought was possible. Steve, Mark, myself, and a handful of others have something that cannot be quantified, something only God could do. We have a true spiritual bond
Aloha. What we all thought was possible. Steve, Mark, myself, and a handful of others have something that cannot be quantified. Something only God could do. We have a true spiritual bond that will not only last forever in this life, but into eternal life as well. And for this, I am truly grateful. One of the things that Steve and the Mitchells have taught me is that it's okay to share your feelings and be loving. I remember hanging out at their home and seeing them hug and kiss their mom and dad goodnight as they were going to bed. Steve would tell them that he loved them. And the way he looked at them, you could tell that his words were genuine. I wasn't brought up like this. So it was hard for me to get used to. But in the three plus decades that we have been friends, he would always tell me that he loved me when we would end our conversations and say our goodbyes. Many have often wondered what our last words on this earth will be. As for Steve and I, I actually know the answer to that. The last time we talked was when he was in the hospital and he was struggling to breathe, but he collected. The way he would talk to me about you, Malia, and brag on how amazing you are, showed me his heart was all there for you as well. And it will always be. This week has been the saddest week in my relationship with Steve. I am helpless, but not hopeless, because I know he is with Jesus. And Jesus has been the first love of his life as long as I have known him. And although it will take me a while to have my heart settled, if he were to be able to tell me one last thing right now, I bet I know what it would be. Wherever you are, you need to be all there. And Steve is all there. Thank you for allowing me to share. And Steve, I love you, man. Aloha. Hello, 
I'm Nathan Lee. I'd like to share some thoughts about my brother and friend, Steve Mitchell. I met Steve when he was a teenager. And it was very clear to me that his parents had instilled in him a deep love for Jesus Christ and the Word of God. If I were to use three words to describe Steve, they would be tenacious, love, and shepherd. Fast forward to 2001. I was in Manila with my family in ministry. Steve came to me and asked, could he go through Gateway Ministries to go to India? Please remember the temperature of the world in 2001. Also know that Dave, Steve's father, sat on the board of Gateway, yet he fully supported what his son was desiring to do. So he went to India. This is where I kind of coined the phrase that Steve is an animal for Jesus Christ, because that was the only way I could describe him. He was like a pit bull. He latched on to Jesus and the word of God, and he wouldn't let go no matter what happened. I remember one time he was sharing with me about his ministry in Mumbai. Now, I worked with the poor in Manila, but I went home at night to a nice home. Steve slept in the slums. He told me about waking up with a rat on his chest. Well, for me, it would have been comfort in the next night. Love? Well, I remember there was a man that hated Steve, and he claimed that Steve had forcibly converted 300 Hindus. Steve had to go into hiding, and after several safe houses, he made it to Manila and lived with us. I remember we were talking about it, and he was pretty upset. And I said, Steve, you know, the Lord was protecting you. He said, that's not it, man. I just wish it was true that I'd converted 300 Hindus. <laughs> Steve had a love for souls. At that time, he also spoke at a retreat called Escape from Temptation Island. He spoke on singleness. He'd come to the resolve that he was going to be single the rest of his life. He went back to India and he called me just a couple months later, and he said, man, I am smitten. <laughs> and that's when he met his wife. He has great love for Supriya and their lovely daughter. His love extended clearly to his parents and interestingly to his brother. And I don't mean that in a wrong way. I have three brothers, but Steve and Mark were best friends. And that really spoke a lot to me. Lastly, Steve was a shepherd. And I want to just say something about that in this day and age. There's a lot of pastors out there that are good theologians, but they're not very good shepherds. Steve Mitchell was a great theologian. But his priority was people, straight from the heart of Jesus Christ. He spent time with his people, and he believed in discipleship. So let me leave you with this. If you want to honor Steve Mitchell, take the impact that he made in your life and do the same thing to people in your life. Help them know the light and love of Jesus Christ. God bless you. To Supriya, Malia, the members and leadership, Fellowship Bible Chapel, on this occasion where we commemorate the memory, celebrate the life of our dear friend and brother, Pastor Steve Mitchell. It's not an easy day or event to understand for us. Like everyone, I was going through photos I had on my computer of Pastor Steve and reflecting on my memories of him, going back to our time in Hawaii, 
when he was pastor of a church in Virginia before coming to Ohio, in Ohio, of course, but also he helped us with our mission program in India. I remember Steve in England and, of course, in India, where the Lord gave him a heart for and a wife from. Be that as it may, this day is not easy for any of us, and there's no easy way to face certain things. But we need to face and understand these things scripturally. Yes, we have grief, but no, we do not have despair, but rather a certain hope. I don't make light of the loss, although a temporary loss. The Lord is dear to those who mourn. I do not make light of bereavement. However, I have been through things like this with unsaved loved ones, family members. I was speaking at Fellowship Bible Chapel the very day I learned that my mother died unsaved, as far as I know, as far as I know. That is not grief, that is despair. Ultimately, of course, only God knows, but with Steve, we know. We know where he is, and we know that he's coming back with Jesus. Grief, yes, despair not. People call these ceremonies, these rituals, where you're presently assembled, by three different names, usually. I've heard them called funerals, obviously, we all have. I've heard them called Thanksgiving services for giving thanks to the Lord for the life of a Christian. And I've heard them, of course, referred to as memorial services. Call it what you will, my apologetic regrets that because of travel restrictions and COVID-19 and the quarantine complications of leaving and coming back to Great Britain, where I'm based, I could not be with you this morning. If I could have been with you this morning, I would have flown to America and to Ohio just to be there. But unfortunately, with the pandemic, it's not possible. With you in spirit, absolutely. Funeral, memorial, thanksgiving. I must respectfully disagree with each of these definitions. I must respectfully take issue of the three ways I've heard where you are now described. This is not the funeral of Pastor Stephen Mitchell. The funeral of Pastor Steve Mitchell is a long past event, as was ours. When he was baptized in water, he was co-buried with Christ. When he came out of the water, he was co-resurrected. Where we are today, where you are today, it's merely perfunctorial. Steve's funeral is long over. He went under, but he came out, and he's with Jesus. This is not his funeral. Well, what is it? This is not the appropriate occasion for a Greek lesson. Bear with me. Sometimes I think of the scriptures in the original languages. There is no Thanos. Thanos is the word for death, meaning separation from God. There's no Thanos. We are never separated from God in Christ. Jesus abolished Thanos. The Greek word for the abolition of death is katargeo. He abolished it. Katargeo means that he rendered it inoperative in Greek. 
You can inflate a rubber ball in a swimming pool or at the beach and push it under the water. But that doesn't matter. It's going to pop up again. Because the law of buoyancy is stronger than the law of gravity. So the law of Christ is stronger than the law of sin and death. The power of sin is in the law. But Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. He took our sin to give us his righteousness. He died our death to give us his life. No, there is no Thanos. Steve is not dead. Then there is necros, tissue deterioration, where we get the word necrosis. People who are breathing, who seem to be alive and well, are suffering necrosis. Tissue in our body is dying all the time. When something is being oxidized, something else is being reduced. Even breathing will kill us. It's just that not breathing will kill us faster. This is because of the fall of man. These things, like biooxidation and entropy, they came as a result of sin. But Jesus paid the price for our sin. Hence, with Steve, the necros is only temporary. Jesus came out of the grave, uncorrupted. So will Steve. There's no Thanos. Jesus abolished it. And there's really no necros. It's a temporary condition. He took our sin to give us his righteousness. He died our death to give us his life. Funerals are about death. In Christ, there is no death. There is only life. Well, if it's not death, and it's not a funeral, what is it? Why are you seated there? What is it if it's not a funeral? Is it a memorial service when we reflect on Steve and our relationship with him? And again, I've thought of these things and shall continue to do so. But you know, it's not about a memorial. It's about an expectation, the blessed hope. Yes, I can remember the things I did with Steve and the fellowship we had and the love that his wife had in their marriage and his precious daughter Malia and the love within the fellowship that Steve pastored. Yes, I suppose we can remember those things, of course. But it's not about the past. No, this event where you are right at this moment is about the future. In Hebrew, we have two words for saying goodbye, or two expressions for saying goodbye. One is shalom, which could also mean peace or fullness. Shalom. But if you're going to see someone again, you don't say shalom. Colloquially, you say shalom velehitraot, peace. I'll see you again. <laughs> My peace I give you, said Jesus. Behold, I go and prepare a place for you. When the Lord returns, our loved ones, including Pastor Mitchell, will be with him. Yes, by all means, remember. But this is not about the past primarily. It's about the future. Thanksgiving. Some people call it a Thanksgiving service, thanking God for the life of a Christian. Well, I thanked God for the life of Steve when he was still with us before he went to be with the Lord. 
I thanked God for his faithfulness, for his friendship, for his ministry, for the fellowship we had together in Christ, for the work he did with and for our ministry in India. We stood together on various issues during times of tremendous opposition due to doctrinal convictions and ethical concerns going all the way back to Hawaii some years ago. But I thanked God for Steve then. I thanked God that I had a friend and a brother who was with me then. What I'm thanking God for now is where Steve is now. To live is Christ. To die is gain. I'm thanking God for the future of Steve. I'm thanking God not simply for what Steve did or what Christ did in and through Steve, but for what's happening now as he stands before Jesus and is coming back with him. No, it's not really a funeral. Funerals are about death. There's no death in Christ, only life. Memorial? Well, okay, we do remember. But it's looking forward. It's expectation. It's anticipation. He's coming again with Jesus. Thanks. Thanksgiving, I've always thanked God for brothers like Steve. In the age of apostasy in which we live, there are not many faithful pastors, but he was one of them. I'm reminded of the verse... The righteous man is taken, but none takes it to heart. Perhaps part of what happened was God removing righteous men from this earth in light of the judgment that's coming. But that's another subject for another occasion. Today, what I'd like to say is this. Supriya Malia you're going to be thinking you wish your husband, you wish your daddy, your father was back just for an hour so you can tell him how much you love him and miss him. Well, first of all, he knows that. His remains don't know it. They're asleep. His body will wake up again. But right now, his consciousness is with Jesus. There are things in the book of Revelation, chapters 19, chapters 6, and elsewhere, that indicate that in some way those who are in heaven are in some sense conscious of what is taking place on the earth. We see... When Babylon falls, the elders and the saints are praising God that it fell. And we're told in Hebrews, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, and Steve, your father, your husband is one of them. You'll wish it was back for an hour. Guaranteed, he will be back for a thousand years. He won't have a COVID infection he won't have viral pneumonia, he won't be a diabetic, and he won't be battling a blood cancer. He'll be back for a thousand years. The separation is temporary. Now let's look forward to a few things. We must be very careful of the sin of necromancy or of thinking that Jesus is a messenger boy, please tell a dead loved one or a loved one who's gone to be with him that we love them. They already know that. There's no need for a messenger boy. But in Christ, we are not cut off from them. They are incommunicado. We can't communicate with them. But remember, we can communicate with Jesus, and they communicate with Jesus. 
Only with Steve, it's face to face. We see through the glass dimly for the present moment. Now Steve knows as he has been fully known, he stands before the Lord. He's talking to Jesus right this instant, out of time and eternity, but he's speaking to Jesus. And at the same time, you speak to Jesus. We'll communicate with Steve again directly. But right now, we have one remaining link. He talks to the Lord. You talk to the Lord. No, the Lord is not a messenger boy telling us what Steve has said or what Steve already knows what we want to say. He's with Jesus. But remember, unlike the unsaved, grief, yes, despair, no. And there's no finality. The world at events like this speaks of his final words or his final wishes or his final resting place. For those in Christ, this is all nonsense. Steve has not spoken his final words. A grave is not Steve's final resting place. His final wishes are not the things he communicated to Supriya and Malia as important and as precious as those things are. Remember, for the Christian, the best is always yet to come. This life in this world is the only taste of heaven that the unsaved are ever going to have. But the sufferings that Steve and we know, and Steve had physically and medically, that's all the hell he was ever going to know. Now, there's only happiness. Only joy, only blessing. And for we who remain, the expectation of seeing him and being with him again. And he will literally, physically be alive on the earth for a thousand years before things become so good, we cannot fathom it. Now, there's another thing I usually tell Christians at a time like this. A headstone. And on the headstone is an inscription called an epitaph, of course. There's only one epitaph that fits a true believer. What I would do, and I would urge you to consider, Pastor Stephen Mitchell, inscribed on the stone, the year of his birth, and the year of his second birth. Not the year of his death, there is no death. He is alive in Christ, and he will physically be alive again. Just the year of his birth, and the year of his second birth. And then, the following epitaph. Temporarily closed for renovations. Will reopen soon. John 5, verse 24. Temporarily closed for renovations. Will reopen soon. John 5, 24. When you go to that grave site, don't look down. Look up. Because that's where Jesus is coming from. And Steve will be with him. God bless my sympathetic condolences to the congregation, to Steve's family from Hawaii and Indiana, and above all, of course, to Supriya and Malia. Thank you.
Well, I just wanted to, I was asked to say some few brief comments. Um, I first met Steve uh, a number of years, uh, 10 years ago. I, somebody, and I don't remember who, directed me to this video that he had put up on his Power to Stand YouTube channel. And he was also writing a blog at that time called Power to Stand. And somewhere I made a comment about preaching it, and uh, he seemed to like that. And somehow we got in touch, and we met up in Winona Lake when he was visiting his mom and dad at one point. And um, the one thing I remember about Steve is that he had a heart for truth. I have not met anyone in my life who exceeded his heart. After um, our first contact, we started talking, and we would talk about, oh, for years, uh, one to four hours per week. He usually ended it with, hey, man, I got to go. I got some beautiful women at home waiting for me. When we uh, started... Uh, Bible study in 2013, and then a few months later at church, we um, knew that Steve was in a small church. He took stands that isolated him from other ministers, that led to attacks from other ministers. So a group of us um, who had sort of become the leadership of this new Fellowship Bible Chapel, we would get in a car and we would drive down to Charleston, West Virginia about once a month and meet with Steve at, uh, for breakfast usually. Spend a few hours praying and talking and then come back. And then I remember one time we went all the way to Roanoke. I remember walking in the house and there was a staircase, as I recall, to the left and up the staircase were about 10 pictures of Malia. <laughs> Nothing else. And I said something like, Malia, I mean, she must have been four or five at the time. I said, I kind of get the impression that you're the most important person around here. And she kind of tilted her head like she does, and she goes, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what my daddy tells me, you know, so <laughs> that was good enough for me. But uh, when we decided to start a church, it was pretty clear that there was one guy. So I won't recount all the stuff. You can find it on our YouTube channel. And when we started that, we would get, you know, 15, 20, 75 views a week. After Steve came, the channel had gotten a little bit better known, and some Sundays his sermon would get three, four, or 5,000 views, and I'd tell him, hey, you must have struck a nerve last week. You got three, he got, and I would tell him how many thousand views he had, and he goes, man, don't tell me that. You're freaking me out. <laughs> so it freaks me out that 50 people or 75 or 100 people come to the church, and I look out and see them live. I can't think about that. Uh, and he did. He just did it because that was Steve. He had a heart for truth, and he had a heart for people. And uh, the stories I've seen over the last week, you've seen some of them today from Dave and Nathan and Frank and Jacob. Uh, some of the stories, you know, when he would tell me that I'm getting freaked out by the number of people watching online, I'm like, you used to live next to a sewer in Mumbai <laughs> with rats on you, and uh, you're freaked out by that. So I guess we all have our thing. But I've never seen a guy. Uh, I've been around pastors all my life. My dad was one. I've never seen a guy who had a heart for people like Steve. And finally, that heart gave out. Hope we'll see him again. Oh, that's a picture from his first Sunday that he preached here at uh, FBC.
Well, good morning. Um, so when all this was getting put together, I, I kind of, how on earth can I represent my brother? Um, how can I speak to all the things of his life? And, um, and I was, had a lack of words to come by. And, um, and then I realized I don't have to. I don't have to speak to his whole life. Uh, he did a really good job of that on his own. Um, and then I knew others were going to be able to speak in a way. And so I come to you as the only human being that has ever physically gotten into a fight with Stephen Mitchell <laughs> on this earth. Um, and so I want to walk you guys through a little bit. Did I just click on that slide? Is that how it... Okay. Um, I'm waiting for them to put that up. There we go. Okay. So you say, well, this isn't my brother. Okay. Uh, and you're correct. All right. Um, but um, I want to I want to start off by I need to tell you about these two for just a moment. Because when I tell you about these two, then other things are going to start to make sense. And so um, my mom and dad. My mother is a very smart woman, okay? Um, she's an encyclopedia. She loves to read. And when I mean she's smart, I mean she is one of the smartest women I know. Um, she is a loving mom. There's no question that Steve or myself could ever go in this existence and not feel loved by, by either of them. Um, she put up with us. Uh, she uh, laughs and has a sense of humor. It is certainly, certainly more appropriate and subdued than the rest of us. Um, and uh, she's an amazing artist. Some of you may not know that, but uh, her ability to paint is just unbelievable. So a very smart, intelligent, loving woman, an artist, and, uh, and our mom. Okay, my dad. So, <laughs> on going through the multitude of pictures that I've been going through in the past, past few days, and they're just hilarious. They are funny. He sets him up, he sets himself in ways to just, I mean, his sense of humor um, from the very beginning. Uh, there's no short of laughter in our family, okay? and that comes also from my dad. Grew up on Pink Panther movies and the sort, and, and uh, humor was always important to us. Also a very smart man. Okay? He taught me about faith, <coughs> taught us both about faith. They lived it. He's an artist. Okay, another one that can, uh, from, this, from the day I was born, okay, showed me just, I, I would always be in marvel of, of, of his artwork and his ability. Um, again, very loving and fun. Okay, so as you see that combination, okay, and the other, the other thing too uh, with, with, my, with my parents is they will leave a legacy. They will leave a legacy. They do. Uh, one of faith, one of strength, and, and, and one of just we felt connected and bonded as a family. That's them. Okay, so when you think of Steve, and you think of me, okay, this is where we came from. All right, so that legacy, his love for people, his passion, his, his wit, his intelligence, his ability to draw, his art, all of these things, you see where it begins, okay? Um, so that's them, and this is us, okay? <laughs> there was a cool time when Speedos were in, and thankfully we were, we were young when it happened. Um, I've, I've not lived my life without my brother. Okay, I'm the youngest, and, and from, from the day I was born, he was my older brother. Okay, and, um, and I had a good brother. 
We had a good relationship. And um, I'm going to take you a little bit, you know, as some of these pictures are going to be a little blurry. You can see how cool we looked uh, <laughs> as, as youngsters. But I want to tell you a little bit about some of our temperaments and our personalities, because we are different. Um, growing up, Steve was, Steve was, he was the studious type, okay? He loved books. Uh, he would, he would read all the time, um, and get me outside. I wanted to play outside, and it was all about getting dirty and, uh, you know, wrestling, and, um, I had the more aggressive streak in me. Um, and Steve, in the early years, um, I would, I don't know, he wasn't passive. That would be not the word, but uh, um, but was more to himself, and he and he fueled up that way. Um, we grew up before Hawaii, okay, in Tennessee. And if you see kind of the background there, um, all the hills, all the things that was our playground. Okay, so for Steve and I growing up, uh, it was about adventure, and and we loved. Uh, our time together, we loved um, just getting lost. Uh, you know, this was the day where we could leave the house, and, and I'm sure we came home at some point to eat. You know, but we would get lost. We'd get lost in the fields. We'd explore uh, the woods that uh, were near us. We would look for Indian arrowheads together. Um, we played, and we played. Uh, but that whole sense of adventure uh, was really kind of what fueled our relationship together. Um, I would want to play with action figures and toys and and swords and things of that nature. And and he he preferred more of the role playing. And he would, we would be characters. And uh, and that's how he chose um, to kind of for us to have fun together. But uh, but we had a good relationship. Um, we loved the outdoors, and we would explore. Whether it's getting in a raft and sailing down a river and not even knowing where we're going to end up, to love being in the mountains. Um, and let me tell you, that water right there would chill you to the bone. Okay, um, but uh, and and again, this sense of adventure, the sense of of um, just just to have fun, that came from my family too. I mean, they were they were right there with us and and doing things for us and. Um, in fact, I'm going to come back here just real quick. You see that yard in this property around the church? That's where I first learned to drive when I was five years old. Uh, you know, as you, as you can see, the hot rod sitting in the, the driveway there. Uh, but my dad was also a car nut, okay? So we grew up with dune buggies and little projects here and there. And, uh, and that's where Steve and I were probably a little different too. So, you know, for me, I was all about as fast as you can go and, and, and getting a little crazy where he was more kind of reserved and careful with those things. But my dad would take me in a dune buggy around this property and he would sit me on his lap. I couldn't even reach the pedals. And he would turn us into spin outs and I would have to get out of them. And uh, so I, I learned to drive pretty, pretty well when I was young. Um, but that's kind of, when I look at our, our younger years together, that was it. We, I mean, we, we loved each other, we enjoyed each other, we had adventure, uh, and we played. Okay? And then my dad got called to Hawaii. So, as you're all wearing Aloha shirts, or many of you, this is the very first one. Okay, um, This is before Steve and I got to Hawaii, and um, and. Let me tell you, to fit into Hawaii, you do not match your shirt and shorts together. <laughs> um, you know, we, we learned that later. But, uh, but if you want to know where that, that Aloha shirt trend started, there it is. That is Steve in his very first one. Okay, and um, Hawaii brought a whole another host of adventure. Okay, um, it was sad for us to leave. And I will tell you, too, this is the age where we also began to be very passionate about music. Um, you know, my dad uh, kind of, you know, it was a shock for him, as you heard in his, his story about kind of the music choices, but he needs to understand he raised us on rock and roll from the 50s, okay? 
we just liked it in the current times. <laughs> but, uh, but his love for music also, we also had a love for music. Um, when we were little, we would, we would get all of the latest um, uh, tapes and you know, on on the, all the popular music uh, from the flea market, they sell all these bootlegged. You know, people would just make copies of it and, and sell it, and and uh, you know, we loved that. Uh, my cousin's with us here. She was a big musical influence for us as well. Lots of lots of dancing and lots of having fun. Um, you know, together. Uh, but our love of music began at a very young age. Um, as we get to Hawaii, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. So, so this is the time frame and probably the only little section of time in my life where Steve and I weren't as close. Okay? Um, we were always close growing up. And uh, it hit that middle school and early high school time. And uh, we just had a lot of differences. And, uh, you know, it was very difficult for us to to get on the same page and you know we would we would argue a lot and um but the love was never gone and i and i and i, I made the joke about the being the only person to to get in a physical fight um it was very anticlimactic. Uh, i can guarantee that um in fact it probably was a little pushing but it, neither of us could either punch each other because we really didn't want to hurt each other uh so even in that angry angry moments that we've had um love kind of prevailed through it. Um, but we got through that time. And um, it really wasn't till you know, faith started to become kind of an important part of our own, own walk and, and who we are, uh, that we really began to, I mean, the brotherhood and the friendship uh, became deep. Um, adventure never left us, okay? And that, in part, again, when you live in Hawaii, uh, your your access to, to adventure goes a lot lot further, uh, and our passion for the ocean, you know, spear fishing with my dad, uh, you know, playing in the waves. Um, this was taken out of the photo photo album of, of me, and my dad, and you wonder where Steve is. Well, he <laughs> he was underneath. <laughs> Um, but we had a lot of fun and, and a, lot of, a lot of time together. Um, our love for nature and being in the outdoors took also many other times. I mean, with our church, hiking in the mountains, and um, really just, uh, you know, whether it was the mountains, the hunting trails, to, um, to the ocean, we loved just being able to explore and do things together. Um, you kind of, you wonder what, did, what is so adventurous about a white sheet <laughs> this is one hour before Hurricane Aniki came, and that sheet eventually was tied to my pants, and we sailed down the street on skateboards once the winds <laughs> got strong enough. So even when we look at, uh, you know, anything severe or extreme was kind of, we were kind of like bugs drawn to the light. Uh, we just, uh, it's kind of how we enjoy life together. Um, the ocean was our second home. And uh, that's where, uh, again, uh, that, that, same, that same drive that, that we had that, that made us a little different, uh, you know, for me, it was about I wanted to get in there. I wanted to be bodyboarding. I wanted to be surfing. I wanted to get into the, the bigger waves. And Steve, he preferred to kind of sit back a little bit on that, or he would like to jump in and, and body surf. We would, you know, um, we, we loved being there. Um, and that was just kind of our second home. That's uh, Waimea Bay shore break, uh, and Waimea Bay is a very special place for our whole family. Um, but Hawaii, the part that shaped us also in a significant way was the friendships that we began to have together. You know, you hear Frank's story about his first time meeting Steve. Uh, I remember very clearly, and strangely enough, it didn't even phase me that that was weird. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and um, but but that's the thing when when I when I think of the friendships that we began to develop that happened when our faith became stronger, right? So even the time that Steve and I weren't getting along as as young young kids, um, our faith wasn't strong either. Um, it wasn't until we began to really 
understand faith to be our own, uh, to experience God in, in a passionate way, to leave any type of you know legalistic form of of Christianity to saying we want to really truly experience God in a in a deep way, and that's when we begin to um, again get into ministry and. We were teaching Bible studies and um, worshiping and just, man, the powerful things that we as a friend group experienced together. Um, as Frank kind of mentioned in his video, it's more like a brotherhood. It's true. Um, the friends, you know, our house was kind of that sanctuary too. We, everyone would gather and hang out. Uh and sometimes, you know, because we're a rowdy bunch of people, um, you know, there. <laughs> one time at least the cops were called on our Bible study. Um, you know, they, some neighbors called saying that there was a big street brawl happening in front of in the street, and it was just us kind of wrestling around and messing around late at night. Um, but uh, there'd be a few times that my dad would sit Frank and myself and Steve down and a few others and 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 let us kind of. I guess, uh, correct our behaviors to, to some degree. Um, but uh, we had just a blast. And, and some of these pictures um, are some of the friendships. No way can I encapsulate all of them, right? And some of the um, uh, Bible studies and what that looked like, we would just pack out a house um, and... You know, I, I believe they're praying that that guy is not sleeping. Um, but, um, but you know, that was a time. That was a time in our life. I'm going to just put it on this for just a moment, um, just to tell you about that time. That again, Christ became real to us. Our faith became real to us, and I, I think that that what drew people to the Bible studies. That's what drew people to Steve. That's what drew people to their band. Um, you know, we're talking the heaviest music you can you can you can play. You know, they were opening up for for bands that would come to Hawaii. I remember uh, one of the bigger death metal bands, Obituary, came to um, Hawaii, and and Steve's band. You know, when they were Bloodbath, they opened up for them, and they were bold. They preached the gospel in places that just has not been preached before. You know, they were they were strong in their faith. And, and they were passionate about it. And people were drawn to that. And that's what drew, draws people to Steve, and that's probably what draws you to some of his teaching as well. You know, we had a passion to know truth. Um, and uh, we, it was just, I can't even, you know, I didn't know that that wasn't as normal for people until I was away from it and realized, wow, that was something really special. And it was special because of the Lord. Um so this part is a, a, another little break in the in, in, in I say the college year. So I was out of high school. I didn't know what I was really wanting to do. I was um, you know working two jobs and, and trying to figure out where what I wanted to do uh, with school. And Steve them and, and a couple of my friends, they decided they were going to Grace College. And um, through lots of conversations, I decided, all right, I'll, I'll try it out. I'll go with you guys, okay? And uh, Steve lasted for a semester. <laughs> um, but but this is what this is this is going to echo some of the things that you heard before. And one of the things that was amazing about Steve is he honestly did love where he was at. You know, in that moment, um, you know, we we come over to Indiana. That winter had. A negative 60 degree wind chill. It was like a some Arctic storm or something coming in. We were all just coming from Hawaii. And I remember talking to him. I'm like, man, this is this is like hell, but the opposite. Like like you can freeze to death by just going outside. I hated it. I hated everything about uh being <laughs> over here. Like I, I was just was like the winter, it's no good. I surfing was about my life. I was like, what on earth did I do? And Steve was as joyful as can be. Um, in that environment, and he embraced those moments, and he embraced people, and um, I think, again, that genuineness that he lived, you know, I didn't have that contentment. I didn't have that, like, okay, yeah, I love being here, you know, um, but 
he made so many friends and had such an impact on people in one semester that, you know, some of them lifelong friends. Um, so just a few little pictures <laughs> of some of our, our time in college together. Um, and again, we were together now. So this is uh, Steve experiencing snowboarding uh, for the first time, and that's basically how it went. Um, but uh, this, is, this is a picture of, of Steve and myself, um, Planet Hollywood in Chicago. And let me tell you what I remember about our trips to Chicago. So it, it's not the, the touristy main spots about Chicago is what I remember. What I remember is us as friends walking around the streets of Chicago and uh, interacting with people who were living on the streets. So I, I met a guy who thought he was Jesus. Um, you know, um, we had a nice long conversation. Uh, it wasn't him. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was about adventure even then. You know, it wasn't about the main stay of things, um, and I was really glad to have him with me. Uh, after that semester, and he decided to go, and it was interesting. He loved being there, you know. Um, I did not, but I couldn't find a real justification to drop out of college. Uh, I knew that there was a reason for me. I need to finish things out. And this is the first time that he and I then are now separated. Okay. Uh, he goes back to Hawaii and uh, takes off with the band. And they have an exciting ministry. He continues to teach Bible studies, continuing to... To play all sorts of places. They even came and um, played one of the, the big uh, Christian music festivals um, in, in in Illinois called Cornerstone. And I was able to, to come up and see him you know, as they played there. But but they had such a vibrant ministry, and he was he was uh, you know back and and God took me on a different path. You know, and this is certainly not about my story, um, but you know, but it but it was still one of ministry and meeting some of the other greatest people in my life as well and doing some incredible things for the Lord, seeing God work. Um, so my dad was talking about Steve moving to the North Shore. It's one of the times I was a little, probably a little jealous of Steve, okay, because as someone who did surf and someone who loved the culture and loved everything, this house is amazing. Okay, you might not see it and see it as amazing, but let me tell you, right around the corner is the best surfing spot in the world. And he, he was front and center stage to that. Um, and, uh, you know, went on to, again to minister to plenty of the youth out there and just, you know, just had a vibrant, vibrant ministry. Um, this, uh, <laughs> so this is, this is, I, I did have a little montage to show everybody our hair phases, but then I took it back because I didn't want it to be on the internal internet. Um, so this is after all of our hair phases, and we, we shaved our heads. Okay, so, so, so you get a little, little taste of, of something. Um, so he goes on to do incredible ministry work, you know, and we stay in touch, of course. Uh, he's, my, he's my brother, and he really was one of my best friends and still is. Um, and... When it comes to the same things that you guys love about him, is the same things I love about him, too, you know? I think of his adventure, his ability to love, and also his ability to forgive, by the way. You know, that was something that also characterized his and my relationship, was that not only do we love, but, but we would forgive each other when we, when we wronged each other and we hurt each other. That was important to us. His humor, his wit... Uh, we've shared it all our life together, and I, I've laughed all my life with my brother. You know, um, you know, he's so smart and intelligent. You would never know it by his schooling. Trust me, it was crazy. Um, but you would know it if you sat down and talked with him. He could sit with a scholar as well as he could sit with someone on the street. It didn't matter. Um, he knew how to relate, and he knew how to to preach the word, and he knew how to express truth in a powerful way. Um, the fact that he loved where he was at, no matter what. You know, everyone is talking about, they surprised about him in the slums in Mumbai. I'm not. I really am not. In fact, it's not impressive to me at all. I had the room right next door to him growing up, and if you saw his room, 
if you saw his room, there would you guys would not be impressed with that. It was it was it was nothing. Uh, in fact, it was a step up. So, um, so he was prepared from a young age uh, for that. Um, but one of the most joyous times for me um, is when he came back, okay? Because he came back with a bride, a sister-in-law. Um, he, I was married. I had his sister-in-law. Um, but he came back, and it was about us being able to be together again. Um, and when I found out he was going to pastor a church in Virginia, it was far, but I was so excited. I was so excited because now we can start having life together again. And, uh, and we did. Okay? Um, now we can share it with ours. Okay? And uh, any time that we could get together, it really was about us having fun, having adventures. Um, you know, and we had these wonderful sons and daughters who are cousins. It remind me all the time of Steve and I and my own cousin. Um, you know, we would just mess around and play so much. And, and there's so many times that they're together that, that, um, that I love. But I love us being able to share just life together. Um, and I loved us being able to talk and debate. Um, my wife did not care for our debates. <laughs> She would always ask me, why, why are you guys always arguing about... It's like, we're not arguing. We're not mad at you. This is, this is what we do, okay? Um, and, and there are times that he would certainly convince me of something different. And there's times that uh, we wouldn't see eye to eye. And, and there's times that we, would, we, we could talk about every component of life together, whether it's spiritual, whether it's personal. Um, you know, we were able to speak into each other's life. Um, and I will miss that. I will miss that. I'll miss, uh, I'll miss us being able to watch movies together as a family. Yeah? And just, just the closeness that our family has. The, and I'm just kind of flipping through some things, just showing kind of, you know, I mean, anytime that we're together, we would do something, you know, fun and inter uh, This is, um, yeah, I. Uh, <laughs> As we were messing around in the woods, and he was just, you know, oh, you know, let's do a photo bomb and things like that. And so he would walk in and, and do these things, and we would just laugh and, and, and just have a, a fun time. Um, you know, when they come to Indiana to visit, it was, it was just always a sense of closeness and something new. Um, so, so I haven't lived my life without my brother, Okay. And I still don't. Philippians 1, 20 through 21. I eagerly expect and hope, this is Paul talking to the Philippians, okay? I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For Steve to live, he lived his life dedicated to his Savior. For him to live, he showed Christ to so many people. So many people. It's amazing to see the flood of those influences. And he left us with the ability to not live without him. Okay? I have my brother. I have my brother. Okay? Um, I want you to take a moment, though, too. Because I don't know who's all watching, right? There's going to be people from Hawaii that see this. There's people from all over the world that will see this, potentially. I don't know who's all, who's all watching it. But... Um, if you're watching because you knew him, you know what I'm talking about. You know, you know how he lived his life, and his love was genuine for you. Um, 
But I want you to take a moment just to think about your life for a moment. Just think about your life for just a moment. And, you know, not in a, a way of any shame. This is not what I, I, I pointed to. Because Steve, Steve wasn't a saint. You know, he, he, he would be the first to tell you he's a sinner just like you and me. Okay, but are you living your life in a way that brings glory? Are you living a, a life that gives the gift of your family, whether it's your wife, your daughter, your brother, your parents, your church, the people that know you and around you? Are you living your life in a way that, that gives, gives back to that, that shows love, that shows forgiveness? You know, we live in right now a very dark world. Um, and you can look around and you can see everywhere you don't see Christ. You don't see Christ in our politics. You don't see Christ in, in the, the destruction, in the, the cities that are burning. You don't see Christ in hatred. You don't see Christ in, in all of the disturbance. But when you look at someone like my brother and you look at his life, you saw Christ in that. Okay. So I just want to encourage those who may, maybe there's people who have walked away from the faith. Maybe there's people that don't believe in, as my dad was calling out to, to people as well, you want to know that truth? You want to know what that's like? Um, I make that charge to, um, you know, I tried to update everybody with those Facebook posts. It's hard. It's hard to do. Um and I know so many people were praying, so many people. And, and when he passed, I know, you know, I heard the expressions of others. There's, there's some that are angry. There's some that are hurting. And I get every bit of it. I really do. But God has truly given us a peace. Um, he's given me a peace. He gave me a wonderful brother to have. And, um, and a best friend. And I, I will miss having him right here with me. Um, there's no question every day, um, but I'm so thankful for the life he led because he gave us a gift that we can celebrate. And so I just want to challenge you as you think about life, what can you learn from that legacy, right? What can you continue to still learn? Are there people to make things right with? Are there, are there, are there ways to say, yeah, I can live a different life because you can? Um, so I just, yeah, I want to leave you with that. And it's Priya, you want to come up? I just want to thank everybody for being here and joining us for this special time for Steve. This is hard for all of us, but we know he's in a better place, and he's not suffering. But I do want to thank you, each and every one for being here, traveling from far, and giving you time. This is a different service than normal service. This is a celebration of life. And I'm so thankful that we can celebrate in Jesus, that we get to see each other again. This is going to be easy. No. But we have the strength and of God, and we're going to go from with the strength of God. And I'm so thankful for that. Because I was just telling someone, without Christ's strength in me, I would not be able to do this. And I'm so thankful for a husband who always encouraged us in that. And he's my best friend. He's my soulmate. And I'm, I'm going to miss him very much. I was going to share how, how we met, and I'm, I'm not going to take too long. When Steve and I met, it was totally a God thing. Because the day uh, we met, we met at a Youth for Christ camp. And it was just amazing because I almost didn't make it to the camp, and neither did Steve. Steve was actually forced <laughs> to come to the camp and speak at the Youth for Christ for, for the youth. I was helping with the youth, and um, my sister got really severely ill, and my mom was like, you can't go. Your sister is really ill. That's my oldest sister. She lost a baby that day, and she almost went to heaven that day. But God saved her. God knew I had to meet Steve, and she was back. And 
we we met at a camp. We I went to the camp. He came to the camp. We were sitting one evening, and that's the evening. That was the first night. I saw him walking down the shoreline, and I wasn't thinking of getting married at that time. I was in my own whole world, you know, trying to deal with things. And I was looking at the page that we had for study, and it said Steve Mitchell. And um, the weirdest thing is when I looked at it, I said, Supriya Steve Mitchell. And I was like, Lord, what is this? I'm not here to find a husband, you know? And I was like, okay, I got it off. I didn't, I didn't think about it anymore. And then, of course, he came and um, he ended up being in my group. Of course, he came and sat in my group. And uh, we prayed and I was reading the Bible. And as Steve says, his world changed from black and white to color. And that was so special. But now our world has changed from color to black and white. But it's still beautiful because the way Steve loved us, it's, it's more than amazing. At the end of the camp on the third day, we exchanged phone numbers and addresses. And, and um, I gave him my number and my address. And I said, well, if you ever come to my town, you know, I'll show you around. And he goes, oh, yeah. And, um, well, and before that, when we talked, he said, he had already li started liking me. And he says, how old are you? And I said, I'm 23. And I think at that point, he had a relief. I was not 15-year-old girl that, you know, he had to marry. <laughs> so he was thankful. He told me later, I was like, hoping you were not 15-year-old girl with all the other girls. <laughs> and I was like, uh, okay. But uh, <laughs> we exchanged. And he said, oh, in two weeks, I'm going to be in your town. And I was like, oh. Great, I'll show you around. Well, he came. He was sitting, the, was sitting on the footsteps of YMCA. I picked him up. I took him home, let my parents know who I was with. I took him to a restaurant called Supriya Restaurant, and we were sitting and eating. I don't even remember the whole conversation we had. We actually sat there for an hour, hour and a half, just talking and getting to know each other. At the end of the conversation, he looks at me, and he says, Would you pray about marrying a guy like me? And I was like, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and we finished our conversation and we went and we walked back to the YMCA I dropped him off and I was walking home and I just kind of started thinking I was like wait a second did he ask me to marry him <laughs> or did he just wanted to know if I would marry a Christian guy like him and so I went home and I told my mom I said I think he asked me to marry him <laughs> I, I don't know and my mom goes, just make sure that you don't want to marry him just because you want to move to the States. And I was like, no, I don't know. And then I don't even remember. We got engaged by the end of August. We met in May. We got engaged on 1st of August. We got married in court on August, September 22nd. We lived apart for a month, and then we got married again in church. And that's when people knew that we were married on October 29th. And this is going to be a hard anniversary without him. We've been married seven years, 17 years, not seven years, 17 years, 17 full years. But God has been so faithful to us. When we got married, we lived in India for a little bit, and then we moved to uh, Hawaii to see mom and dad. And we lived with mom and dad for a year and a half. And, and just the ministry, we, he started doing his Bible study again on Tuesday nights and, you know, it's such a blessing to see a man, a godly man. I was so thankful I married a guy like him. <laughs> a godly man who loves the Lord so much. Well, after a year and a half, we didn't know what we were going to do. And he started thinking about being a pastor somewhere or doing some ministry. And when we found out that Garden City needed a pastor, he applied. And they just, you know, we moved. We moved with just two bags of clothes to Roanoke. And... There he pastored for nine years, and it was a wonderful church ministry that we did. We, have, we started Bible studies on Monday, and we got so many young people, and they're here today, and thank you for being here. And just his ministry was just the love for people, as you know, and you guys all have felt it, was just so amazing. The love for me and Malia, you know, we're going to miss his hugs, his kisses, him waiting for us when we get home from school. All those things are going to be hard. But God's good. God's good. Because he loves us and he won't abandon us. 
I'm sorry, I'm all over the place with this. I have my notes and I'm not even looking at it. But after we moved from Roanoke, when the church called us here, you know, God really closed doors for us. And Steve and I prayed about it. We didn't even think we would be in Ohio because we thought we were going to be in Roanoke forever. And sometimes when you look back and you think, why God has you in certain place at certain times? What is the reason, Lord? And sometimes Lord will show you the reasons, and sometimes he won't. For now, it is for sure why we are here and why God had us here. Not that Roanoke wasn't a place where people wouldn't have loved us. It is. It is because they're here. And thank you guys. From And I see Justin and Diana here too, so thank you for coming all the way from Roanoke, Virginia to be here. But God has you for a reason at a certain place at a certain time. And I see the reason now. You guys have been the biggest blessing to Steve and me and Malia. He loved you guys from the bottom of his heart. He loved having coffee and going for breakfast with each and every one of you. He loved spending that time. Every time he came home after visiting you guys, He always was so happy and so excited again to meet with you guys. The dessert clubs were fun. There were times where we were goofy, and (laughs) but we loved it. Just everything that God has done in our life and in our family, we are so blessed to have Steve in our life. Because without Steve, we wouldn't be here. And without Steve's ministry... God wouldn't bless us today. What Steve has done for the Lord, the Lord is blessing me and Malia through that right now. Because each and every one of you loved us and love us and loved him. The biggest thing he was also excited was being at the school at DCS and ministering to those kids. He really loved those kids and he was excited every time he got a call from Mr. Lowe saying, Hey, do you want to sub? And he would always say, yeah, of course, you know, unless he had already prior meetings. Those kids loved him. And I just want to thank you, DCS family, for loving on him, loving on us, and letting him have the opportunity to be there. Because he loved what he did, and he had the heart for, for those young people. And I know the kids loved him because at the beginning of the school year, they always would say, Mrs. Mitchell, is Mr. Mitchell going to come and teach? And I said, yes, <laughs> he will be there when Mr. Lowe calls him. So thank you, DCS. Thank you for loving us, too. It's just been an amazing school for Malia and for me to be there. So thank you for all your support. I want to thank everybody here for loving us, supporting us, bringing us food, bringing us flowers. Thank you for bringing flowers for me for On our anniversary, I do really appreciate. That was very special. I know Steve wouldn't want to miss our anniversary. And there was not a day where he didn't bring me flowers. He always made it special. And I'm going to miss him so much. There's going to be a hole in our heart. But we know we'll be able to see him. And that's our hope. And I want to thank everybody online for praying for us. I mean, there were thousands and thousands of people that are praying for us even now. And we just want to thank everybody from the Mitchell family for all your encouragements, all your prayers, and your love and support for us. We're going to miss him, but he'll always be in my heart. His goofiness. (laughs) I know some of you have seen (laughs) some videos. And I'm going to miss, I I can't be goofy with anybody like I can be with him. And that's going to be really hard. But I just want to thank you, thank you, thank you so much for everything that you guys have done and are doing for our family. I love you guys. And I know Steve would say, love you, man, or love you, everybody. And Malia and I just want to say, we love you guys, too. So thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for 
Pastor Steve. Thank you for what he has meant to us, for our local body, to the greater body of Christ around the world. Thank you for his family. Father, we thank you that he has gained the prize. Scripture tells us that there's a prize at the end of this life for those who believe in Jesus Christ. Our brother, husband, father, son, our brother has made it. He ran the race. He was like uh, the Apostle Paul, who said that he was striving to the end so that he could achieve the prize. And for those of us who know Jesus Christ, who have asked him to forgive us of our sins, who died on a cross to make a way possible for the remission of sins. He is looking to each of us to hand us the prize when we get there. Thank you, God, for Supriya and Leah. We pray that our church will continue to put their arms around her and support her into the future. We love her. And just a couple days before our pastor passed away and went to heaven, he called me. And what were the last three words that he said to me before we hung up? I love you. The same thing that he has shared with many, many people. Father God, thank you for a brother in Christ who, first of all, loved you, loved his Lord and Savior, his Redeemer. Thank you that he has brought, uh, that you have brought him into our path and into the pathway of many, many people around the world. We are blessed because of him. And we pray that his testimony, his behavior, his character, the attributes that were a part of his ministry to people would be inculcated in us, the love of Christ. And all those attributes that Christ has that were passed to him Steve passed those on as well. What an influence that man has been in our lives. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you for him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, you're dismissed. speak at all Lift me up and let your spirit fall When it's hard to let you know what's wrong Give me words to make a brand new song You know my words before I can say For you, just take them This is my heart song to you Let in spirit and in truth Honor and worship to the King Your presence fulfills all I need Take this life that you free Draw near and listen close this is my heart song to you When I tried to say way too much Quiet me with your gentle touch When I tried to do it on my own Rescue me 
me and let your plans be known You know my words Before I can say them Hidden inside for you Just take them This is my heart song to you Let in spirit and in truth Honor and worship to the King Your presence fulfills all I need Take this life that you free Draw near and listen close This is my heart song to you This is my heart song to you There in spirit and in truth Honor and worship to the Fulfills all I need Take this plan that you free Draw near and listen close This is my heart song to you
When it's hard to even speak at all Lift me up and let your spirit fall When it's hard to let you know what's wrong Give me words to make a brand new song You know my words Before I can say them Hidden inside for you Just take them This is my heart song to you Let in spirit and in truth Honor and worship to the Fulfills all I need Take this life that you free Draw near and listen close This is my heart song to you When I tried to say way too